Grace be to you and peace from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God to which we turn our attention this morning is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 1, beginning with verse 14. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. So far the word. In Christ Jesus, our Savior, who enlightens us with his truth, dear fellow redeemed, There are certain words and terms that we use that we're so accustomed to using and we understand what is meant by them that if we are asked to define them or to explain them, we might be a little hard-pressed at first to come up with how to do it because it's just that. For example, what does it mean to be humble? Well, it's to be humble. How do you go about explaining that? Or, what does it mean when you say, I believe in Jesus my Savior? Well, it means that I have faith in him. What does it mean to have faith in him? Well, I believe in him. It's hard to put a definition to some of these terms. When we think about things and words and terms and expressions that we use in our faith life, we know what they mean, but we can also grow accustomed to them and perhaps don't think always about their greater significance. What is the underlying meaning? And if we are in a position to explain it to someone else, that might be even the more difficult. Even something as simple, or relatively simple, as saying, I am saved by grace, and the gospel is the power of God for salvation. What exactly does that mean? So this morning we consider that powerful truth of Paul written to the Romans, that the gospel is the power of God for salvation, And we explore the deeper significance of that through a series of questions. If it's salvation, it means that there has to be something from which we are saved. What is it? Power? How? And news to spread? Why? We pray that as we think of these answers, which are so forefront in our minds and in our hearts, that we can dig deeper this morning and grow in our appreciation for the answers to these questions and rejoice all the more in the gospel truth. The Apostle Paul explains why there is need for salvation. Partway through our text, he says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. The wrath of God is no small thing. The children of Israel gathered on Mount Sinai, as we heard in the Old Testament reading, were frightened by the thundering, by the lightning, and by the sound of the trumpet and the voice of God from the mountain, that was God declaring his law. Imagine the wrath of God directed in judgment and punishment upon a sinner. It is no small thing and not something to be treated lightly. The full wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. What is, what qualifies as ungodliness and unrighteousness? For that we go to God's law. It is the law of God that reveals to us what his will is, and therefore what is sin, unrighteousness, lawlessness. So we go back to Exodus 20 in our Old Testament reading, where we have the familiar Ten Commandments. God begins, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. If we take that mirror of God's law and the Ten Commandments and shine it on our lives and in our hearts, we perhaps don't ever find bowing down to an uncarved image. 
We would not find any open idolatry in the sense of worshiping any god other than the true God. But when we dig deeper, we will find that we have not always loved God above all other things. We have not always trusted in Him, trusted in Him perfectly above all other things. We have loved the things of this world at times superseding our love for Him. We dig deeper into the thoughts and the inner workings of our heart and understand that it's more than just that gross idolatry of false gods. We understand that there is unrighteousness and ungodliness in our hearts as revealed by the first commandment. But it's so easy to look out in the world and look at the idolaters who are in fact worshiping and following a false god. It's so easy to brush off a commandment and say, there is the unrighteousness. There is the ungodliness. I'm pretty good. But again, that deeper look, save from what? From the sin that infiltrates and corrupts my heart. The second commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Again, hearing the echoes of God's seriousness, the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. The name of God being those actual names that he has given us, revealed to us of himself, but also all that he tells us about himself in his word. So any false teaching is breaking the second commandment. Any hypocrisy is breaking the second commandment on top of the cursing, the swearing, the practicing witchcraft that Luther identifies in his explanation to this commandment. Again, perhaps we have a pretty clean life on the outside in this regard, but then we also understand that we fail to call upon God's name as fully and as wonderfully as we can and ought. We don't rely on him entirely the way we should, and we also do not fully use his name to its, to its fullest extent properly in our thoughts, words, and deeds. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, The Sabbath day law of the Old Testament, the ceremonial portion of this law, not working on Saturday, the sacrifices, those things have been fulfilled in Christ. He has accomplished those things. But the moral essence of that law is still there. The moral law connected to the Sabbath day was take time for your spiritual well-being. Don't forget the needs of your soul. Go to his word, nurture that soul, feed it, and do not despise God's word or the preaching of it. Honor your father and your mother, including all earthly authority that God has placed over us. You shall not murder, but it goes beyond that the gross sin of murder to hatred toward others, ill thoughts, hurting or harming our neighbor in any way, or not living up and not to God's expectation and not helping in every possible way. You shall not commit adultery. Every action, every word, every thought that is contrary to God's design of one man plus one woman for a lifetime and the sexual relationship reserved only for marriage and marriage is man and woman, all those things, anything that changes what God has said about marriage adulterates it and is included in the sixth commandment. You shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, and that commandment can be broken even with the truth. For if I speak truth from a false heart, with the intent to hurt my neighbor, to ruin his good name and reputation, that is just as much false witness as if I lied. And then not coveting the non-living things like my neighbor's house or the living things such as my neighbor's wife, male servant, female servant, ox, donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Anything, thought, word, action, anything, the tiniest to the biggest, that is contrary to, to that clear and sure word of God is ungodliness and unrighteousness. And the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all such things. Add to that God's word that if you sin once, you're guilty of all. And the question, save from what? Becomes very clear. We are born with a sinful, corrupt nature We add to that sin day by day as sin grows out of our sinful nature and are, by nature, by rights, under the full wrath of God. That is the the death and destruction from which we need salvation. The gospel is the power of God for salvation from that death, from that judgment. We have to understand the full reality of our sin to really understand and appreciate 
the depth of God's love and the full reality of that salvation. Paul goes on to say, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth, sinfulness, sin in every way suppresses the truth. We see it all the time, at times perhaps in our own flesh, but also around us, the desire to sin, the desire to fit in, the desire to rationalize what is wrong, all suppresses the truth. Think about that for a bit. At any time where I have tried to defend myself and not own up to my sin, when I've tried to defend myself, it wasn't my fault, it wasn't me, I didn't really sin, or to rationalize, it can't be that wrong. Every time we ignore sin, try to rationalize sin, or dismiss sin, we are suppressing the truth. Because the truth of sin is real, as revealed by God. Paul goes on, For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. But God, I didn't know. There's so much evidence in the world around. His power is evident in what he created. His eternal goodness is evident in how he provides for us. There are witnesses to God, God's existence in the world around us and in our own consciences. There is no excuse to ignore and to deny that he is there. And his word explains who he is and what his expectations are. We consider our sin in the light of God's word. We consider the extent to which our sin affects others, at times bringing hurt and destruction to others in their lives and their hearts. We are indeed corrupt, indeed in need of salvation which is why the gospel is such sweet news, that God sent Jesus to die to take away all of that guilt. And you can understand the suppressing of truth that is taking place in Christianity today when churches don't talk about sin. If you do not talk about sin, if you do not look at why salvation is needed, you have ripped the heart right out of the gospel. And in fact, it is no gospel at all. Because if our destruction, our damnation, our need isn't there, if we don't need to be saved from anything, what difference does the Savior make? Why would I long for or find joy in salvation? The gospel is the power of God for salvation. Power? How could that be? Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. In this sinful state from which we seek rescue and salvation, there's no ability for us to rescue ourselves. We can't keep the law. We can't bring ourselves to faith. We can't pay that penalty. But the gospel declares to us the good news. Jesus did it all. Jesus, the Son of God, took on that flesh and blood to take your place. You can't live up to God's expectation. Jesus did it for you. You can't pay the debt of your sin except for eternal suffering in hell. Jesus did it for you. Jesus for you to give you his righteousness in place of your sinfulness. That blessing comes through faith. The gospel declares, here's what Jesus has done. Believe it. But we can't. But the power of God can change our hearts of stone and unbelief into hearts that put their trust in that loving Savior and all that he has done. Salvation comes to us not by what we have done, but through faith in Christ Jesus. Through that faith, we receive the blessings that Jesus won for us. That faith, the righteous shall live by faith, not by our deeds, not by anything we can accomplish. And the power of the gospel, that powerful word of Christ, creates the faith to believe, nurtures that faith, preserves that faith, and brings salvation to us. The power is God's. The power lies in that good news announcing to us the full and free salvation and brings it to us through the faith which God supplies. The law cannot do that. As we sang in the hymn leading up to the sermon, the law is perfect. It's good and wise. 
But since the fall, it condemns us all because we are sinners. The problem is not in the law. The problem is in our hearts and the sin. But the law cannot save because we cannot live that perfect life. The gospel and the gospel alone brings salvation. The gospel is our motivation to follow Christ. We can't, we could, you can conform life by threats of the law to a certain point, but you have an unbeliever conforming to the rule of the law. The gospel changes hearts. The gospel changes lives. It's not a mere conformity. It's a transformation of old and sinful to new in Christ Jesus. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. This is good news. Why? Because it's for all people. It's not just for a select few. It's not just for us. It's not just for me. It's for every sinner. And so Paul opens up our text. I'm under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, non-Greeks, non-Jews, both to the wise and to the foolish. I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. The news was great. The news was good. The news was of salvation. The news had the power to bring sinners to life. And Paul was compelled, called by God to proclaim that gospel to the Gentiles. He said, I'm called equally obligated to the Greeks, the non-Greeks. He also proclaimed it to the Jews when they would listen. He took the news because that gospel was his joy to preach. It was the power of God for salvation. How are you saved? You are saved by your dear Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How did he do it? He took your place in living up to God's expectation and paying the debt and the punishment of your sin. How did that come to you? It comes through the gospel, which is the power of God for the salvation I so desperately need and so wondrously have in my Lord. Amen. The peace of God who surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus.